ready to roll. Hello, my name is Doug Roper, and I'll bring you the Sunday School lesson today from Southside Baptist Church. And before we begin, let's begin with a word of prayer. Come here, Father God, I just come to you today, Lord. Thank you so much for just the opportunity to come into your house, Lord, and just to share your word and to talk about this lesson today, Lord. And I just pray as, as we talk about how your son Jesus came to deliver us from our sin and to give us the good news of salvation, Lord. And for those of us who have asked him to come into our heart as our Lord and Savior, Lord, we get received the that forgiveness of the sin, Lord, and also the promise of heaven. So, Lord, I just pray you'll be with me as I bring this lesson today, God, that you'll speak in and through me. Lord, that you'll use my words to help proclaim the good news of your gospel. And through it all, may you receive all the praise and the glory. And I do pray this in the name of your Son. Amen. Now, as I said, we're going to start today. We're going to be in Luke, and we're going to talk about how Jesus came to deliver the good news of salvation and how he came to deliver it for all people, not just us, but everybody, you know, Jews and Gentiles alike. And so as we begin, first of all, these verses are, we're going to be in is Luke. The first one will be Luke uh, chapter 3, 1 through 6. But we need to understand when it comes to Jesus, see, he was on a specific mission. You know, his mission was intentional. And so when it comes to Jesus, we find not someone who stumbled into this role, but instead a perfectly orchestrated and intentional mission from God. And we need to thank God for sending Jesus to deliver the good news that we need about salvation. So as we begin the verses, and we're going to start, we're going to start in Luke 3. These start with John the Baptist. So we'll be talking about John the Baptist first part and then we'll go on into Jesus on the second part of the verses. But in Luke 3, 1 through 6, this, this begins with kind of a, a colorful description of, of uh, John the Baptist and who he was and how his uniqueness began long before the moment when he began to preach and call the people to repentance. Lesson tells us that it began even before he was born. It says his mother and father, his father was Zechariah, he was a priest of the temple, Elizabeth, his mom. Well, they were both, you know, advanced in years. They loved God and they, they were not able to have a child. So in that culture, in that day, if you were not able to bear a child, especially a son, it was a kind of a sign of divine displeasure where like God was not pleased with you or you were not in his favor. That's not necessarily true and it's not true, but it is what they believed at that time. So she wasn't able to have a child. So one day Zachariah's in the temple, he's performing his priestly duties and he gets a visit from an angel. Now this angel, tells him that despite their age, that Elizabeth is going to have a, a child and she's going to have a son. And he said, you know, he told him all kind of things about John and who he was going to be. He said that uh, he was going to be filled with the Holy Spirit from birth. He said that people everywhere would rejoice at his birth and that he would go before the Lord and would be responsible for turning people back to God. The angel said that this child would be great in the sight of the Lord. And it also said that, uh, you know, he was going to be a prophet and it, it was, you know, de designated for him even before he was born that God had chosen him for this ministry. So John prepares the way for Jesus and for his ministry. And so we're going to talk about what happened that after this and when Isaiah prophesied about Jesus and, and his ministry. But first, let's begin with Luke 3, 1 through 6. It says, and some of these words are hard to pronounce. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judah, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Iduria and Traconitus and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, 
says, During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the desert. It says, He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all mankind will see God's salvation. Now, let's talk about this a little bit. See, John, as I said earlier, prepared the way for Jesus to come. And, and it said that tradition tells us that uh, in Luke, the third gospel of Luke, he was a physician and he, he also was a co-worker of Paul. But it says most people believe that he wrote this writing somewhere between A.D. 50 and A.D. 90. But Luke was careful he, he really investigated his sources so he could, he could present an orderly account of Jesus' life. So, you know, the book of Acts is a continuation of, of Luke's writing. And as well, it says here, as a combination uh, or a continuation of what Jesus was doing, you know, through the Holy Spirit. It says that Luke's gospel and Acts which I thought was kind of interesting. It said, Luke's 1 presents the events that are surrounding John the Baptist's birth, an announcement to Mary that she would, you know, bear Jesus. Luke, uh, chapter 2 in Luke tells us that these are the events surrounding Jesus' birth and his childhood. And then chapter 3, where we are today, describes the ministry of John the Baptist and the beginning of Jesus' ministry. So again, when it first starts out, it talks about Tiberius Caesar. And this is saying that they believe that John's, bab or John's preaching would have been around AD 27. And it lists these various leaders and brothers and everything. And so it reveals Luke's historical diligence in trying to make sure everything was correct. Now it tells us in verse 2 and 3, it says God's word. It says, before his birth... God set, set John apart to be a prophet before his birth. And it says that the function of a prophet is to speak God's word, to speak his message. So this phrase puts John in line with the Old Testament prophets who had not spoken since Malachi, which is like 400 years earlier. So with this being said, John talked about Baptism of repentance. Now, baptism is an immersion in the water. We believe you're fully immersed in water. And what it is, it represents an outward symbol of an inward change. I always like to say it's an outward expression of an inward experience. So, I mean, baptism doesn't save you, but it does show you how you were, uh, were once dead to sin, how you were buried with Jesus, now you're raised again to begin your new life. So, it's represented this outward change, and uh, repentance involved a change of mind. When we talk about repentance, we say repentance is like you change direction. You know, it, it, it means that, you know, your thoughts... And your actions change from one, like you're heading one way, to you make a complete about face and head the other way. You know, it, it, like, like I said, it, it, it's a picture of someone who's walking one way, they stop, turn around internally and go back the other way. That kind of gives you the idea of what it is meant. But merely feeling sorry or feeling sorrow is not repentance. That's not what that is. So... Verse 3 tells us that, that the purpose of repentance is for the forgiveness of sin. And forgiveness for believers is a present possession. What that means is it's, a, it's what happens here and now as well as what we're expecting to happen in the future. And the gospel message is that forgiveness through Christ, through his sacrifice on the cross, enables the right relationship with God once we've accepted Jesus into our heart as our Lord and Savior. So Isaiah often wrote 
about the coming of the Messiah. And it talks about the prophet Isaiah in chapter in verse 4. And this was a further fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy in the coming of the Messiah who would bring deliverance from sin for all the people who would believe in him. So John's mission was to prepare the way. You know, he prepared the way and what the verses were telling us, the same way as, as people prepared the way for like a king or some dignitary that was coming to visit, you know, they would make travel easier for that person to come. So John was saying that his message was for people to repent of their sins so they would be ready to receive the Messiah. You know, in verse 4 and 5, it talks about several actions that they would do. And, and when he was talking about, you know, make, uh, in verse, let's, let's just read it again. Verse 4 and 5 says, you know, as it is written in the books of the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley will be filled, every mountain and hill will be made low, the crooked will become straight, the rough ways smooth. So what it is saying is, that is what they used to do when these dignitaries or kings were coming. They would go out and try to smooth the road, try to figure in all the, fill in all the divots and the potholes and stuff. And said so they would even try to, you know, smooth out some of the mountains and stuff and, and fill in some of the valleys and make the road straight. So it made the traveling a lot easier. So in that being said, see, John prepared the way of the Lord by preaching repentance to straighten out a crooked generation. In other words, he's, he's telling people you need to come back to the Lord. You need to ask for repentance of your sin, you know, to make your path straight. And he also preached humility, which required lowering oneself before God. So John's message pointed to the Messiah who would bring salvation to all who believed in him. And Jesus' parents when they brought him to the temple when he was eight days old, you know, later Simeon saw him and he declared, my eyes have seen your salvation. Now, when he said that, he's talking about once he saw Jesus because God told him you would not die until you have seen the Messiah. So he says, now I have seen your salvation. In other words, he means the salvation of our sins would be coming through Jesus Christ. And he says, I'm ready to go now, God. You've, you've let me live until I've seen your salvation. So Jesus is God's son. Not only that, but Jesus is God's salvation for all of us who trust in him. Now, we're going to move on from chapter 3 into chapter 4. And as we get into chapter 4, we're going to begin in verse 14 through 19. Now we're going to talk a, a more about Jesus' ministry and how that came about and what he did. So, John prepared the way for Jesus. When Jesus began his public ministry, uh, what happened when we get to this point in the verses we're going to read here, Jesus came to John. She asked John to baptize him. John said, you should be baptizing me. I'm not even worthy to untie your sandals. But Jesus said, no, it must be as the prophecy states. So John baptized him. And then you all remember it said the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove. And God said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Well, then Jesus left that. Then he went into the wilderness for 40 days where he was tested by the devil. Well, after Jesus sent him away after those 40 days of testing, it said the angels came and took care of him. And after that, this is where we begin in these verses. And Luke 4, first of all, it's going to be Luke 4, 14 through 19. And it says here, Then Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. That's where Jesus grew up as a child. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. So Jesus was always going to the synagogue, even in his younger years, before he started to preach. He says, and he stood up to read. I said, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. 
because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, a recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And so now when he read this, it's going to talk about, like I said, where Jesus prepared, or John prepared the way for Jesus, Jesus begins his public ministry when he enters the synagogue and begins to read from Isaiah. It says, you know, he created quite a stir, as everybody said, and what we've seen of the miracles that he performed, you know, and the authority that he had in his teaching. So when we get to Luke 4, it said Jesus' pathway has found him back at his hometown of Nazareth. You know, this is Jesus, and this is Jesus and his mission, which was foretold over 400 years earlier that now he's here fulfilling those ancient words when he read from, the, what, from what Isaiah said. And he was chosen by God, and he was set apart for this specific and sacred purpose. See, Jesus declared that he is the long-awaited Messiah. And so Isaiah prophesied the purpose of Jesus' mission. So when Jesus returned to Galilee, following his baptism, as I said, and after he spent the 40 days in the wilderness being tempted by the devil, it says he walked to uh, Nazareth, which was about 70 to 80 miles. So anyway, Jesus is God. You know, and in a way that's really hard for us to completely understand. But the Son had complete access to the Father and to the Holy Spirit. So when it talks about teaching in the synagogues, Jesus' primary activity during his early years was teaching. And it says, when you talk about synagogues, what usually went on, it said worship typically included prayer. It included reading from the Old Testament, followed by an explanation of the verses, and then the singing of the psalm. Well, as I said, Nazareth was Jesus' childhood home, and said it was until he was about 30 years old when he began his ministry. So here's something you may not be aware of. The Jewish Sabbath day began on Friday at 6 p.m., and it ended on Saturday at 6 p.m., and it was designated as a day of rest and worship, which was based on what was said after God's creation. It says on the seventh day he rested. So with that being said, <clears throat> excuse me, when Jesus unrolled the scroll, you know, he was looking for a specific pa passage. There was something specifically that he wanted to read. And it said what he read was in Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. And then also Isaiah 58, 6. And it described the focus of Jesus' ministry in detail. You know, Isaiah 61, 1 through 3 is a prophecy of the coming Messiah, the future anointed one, who would fulfill God's plan. So, and Jesus said when he read, the Spirit of the Lord is on me, he was identifying with God's Spirit. You know, Throughout the Gospel of Luke, you know, the Holy Spirit is really emphasized and it talks about the Trinity. While we may not all completely understand the Trinity, it breaks down the word here. Tri means three and unity means one. So the Trinity was talking about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And it said it was really first used around 200 A.D., but we can understand that God has revealed himself as the Father and as the Son and as the Holy Spirit, united as one into three distinct persons. So Jesus says, because he has anointed me, meaning the Messiah, the anointed one, he said, would be a person in whom God's spirit fully dwelt, which is again was in Jesus. And verses 18 and 19 tells us that it states a purpose for which Jesus was anointed and what he would do in his ministry. So he was going to preach the good news to the poor. And uh, when he preached this good news to the poor, 
Part of Jesus' mission was to preach the good news. And the good news is God's salvation is available to everyone, including the poor. It was available to everyone. And he said in verse 18, he has sent me. You know, Jesus came because God sent him as Emmanuel, which means God with us, to preach the good news so that all that would believe in him would be saved. So Jesus told his father, or told his disciples, that the father had sent him in Luke, I mean in John 20. So he was here not just to proclaim the good news, but to proclaim the release of the captives. Now Paul acknowledged here that all people were captives or slaves to sin, and that believing in Jesus brought release from that sin. That's in Romans 6. But it says here that, that Jesus came to set free the oppressed. You know, salvation in and through Jesus Christ set free all who were oppressed by Satan. In other words, those that Satan had burned down with the weight of guilt of their sin and their sin itself. Well, this salvation comes by trusting in Jesus. See, Jesus brought God's favor. He brought his salvation to the entire world, and especially to all those who would believe in him. So as we continue on and finish up in our verses here, we're going to read verse 4, chapter 4 again, 20 and 21. So when I read this passage, Jesus tells them what has happened. He says here in verse 20 and 21, he says here that, Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And what he was saying is, when he read this passage, he continued, he's telling them, Today, this passage has been fulfilled. He's saying, in other words, I am him. I am the one. I'm the one you've been waiting for. And you're bearing witness to this fulfillment in these very own words that I have spoken. See, God's faithfulness never changes. You know, Jesus is the expected Messiah. You know, the crowd in the synagogue, they love this pronouncement. You know, they were, they were bearing witness, you know, to what generations had been waiting for. That Jesus was here. The Messiah was here. The promised one was here. The promised one of God, the Messiah, and even better for them, he'd come from their own small town of Nazareth. And Jesus is also the unexpected Messiah. And what that means is even though they expected the Messiah, they didn't expect this kind of Messiah. See, they were thinking Jesus was going to come as a military ruler or as a king that would, you know, save them from their oppression in Rome, you know, that would restore Israel. But no, that's not why Jesus came. So when we encounter Jesus ourselves, you know, we can't try to bend him into a version of himself that's more to our liking. You know, we have to give him all our assumptions, all our preferences, and our desires must be brought under his lordship. Because Jesus came to deliver the good news of salvation for all people. So when he rolled up the scroll and he gave it back to the intendant, it says this event provides insight in the first century synagogue of service. Jesus stood, read from Isaiah. After he finished, he, he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant. Well, the attendant said he probably took the scroll, placed it in a wooden box that they called an ark, and that's where the scripture and the scrolls were stored. So after Jesus read the scripture, those present waited for him to explain it. Now, a little history about Nazareth at this time. It said it was a small village. Less than 500 people lived there. And this was in the first century of Jesus. And it said the women and children probably outnumbered the men and it said there was probably less than a hundred men in this village of Nazareth and it said that women is an interesting thing here were not allowed in the synagogue unless they were behind a screen aren't you glad that's not the way it is today 
But anyway, Jesus was saying, today as you listen, see, Jesus' words were more of an application of Isaiah's prophecy about the Messiah than merely an explanation of the scripture. See, like I said, the Jews were looking for God's kingdom to be a restored Israel. But Jesus told his listeners that God's kingdom had already come and had come in him. So he's saying the scriptures have been fulfilled. And because of Jesus' incarnation, his coming as a God-man, Emmanuel, God with us, he was now the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, of whom God's spirit fully rested. Jesus fulfilled Isaiah's words about the Messiah in several ways. And I'll go through these here as uh, we finish up the lesson here. He said, it said, first of all, it said, God's spirit was upon Jesus from his conception. It says, not only that, but it was on him at his baptism, in his ministry, through his death to his burial, as well as his resurrection and his later appearances to the others after he was resurrected. It tells us, second, through his spirit, God anointed Jesus. The Father gave the Son his mission of salvation. And Luke lists the elements of that salvation. Now, third, it talks about where Jesus preached the good news to the poor, See, at that time, probably most people, it says here in the lesson that maybe as many as 90% of the people were poor economically. But see, people are also poor in spirit. You know, many had lost hope. So both groups needed God's good news. And the fourth one here says that God sent Jesus to proclaim release to those in captivity of sin. You know, Romans 3 tells us all people have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And Paul wrote, but thank God that although you used to be slaves of sin, you obeyed from the heart that pattern of teaching to which you were handed over. And having been set free from sin, you became enslaved to righteousness. And that's in Romans 6. So then also the fifth one here says that God sent Jesus to help the blind recover their sight. Now, we know of some of the miracles that Jesus did, that he recovered blind men and they were able to see. Okay, so we know he did that. He, was, he physically healed those who were blind. But also here, blindness can mean spiritual blindness. And then the sixth one says that God sent Jesus to free the oppressed. Now, see, the Jews... They viewed Rome as their oppressor, and they thought the Messiah would come that would deliver them from Rome. Again, they were looking for a military leader or king. But the Bible points out that sin and Satan is what oppresses people. And since all people have been oppressed by sin, God sent Jesus to free us and to give us abundant lives. In the seventh year, it says, God sent Jesus to proclaim the year of God's favor. Well, it's talking about here that Jesus' first coming, you know, concluded, or excuse me, let me, let me back up here. It says, it's talking about here that uh, the New Testament presented the present era as the last days. And what it means by that, that began first with Jesus' coming, and it will conclude when he returns again. So, in making this announcement in the year of God's favor, Jesus was pointing to himself as initiating that time. The time is now. God's favor is salvation that is only found in Jesus Christ, his son. So, with these elements, these seven elements that I just read to you and talked to you about here, see, Jesus pointed to himself as the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy of the coming Messiah. You know, it had been 400 years since the prophet Malachi had had any prophecy at all. So it had been over 400 years since there was any prophecy from any prophet. And the Jews had been waiting for a word from God. 
on this day, when Jesus read these verses in the synagogue about Isaiah, the Jews received, the Jews of Nazareth received the good news of the word from God. 